Thanks, Mary Ann. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to talk about trade and services, both imports and exports. And while it may not have the urgency of other topics in the economic sphere in this current uh, credit market crisis, I think it's a topic that has been with us for a while and will continue to be with us. Um, whether it was Business Week's Is Your Job Next several years ago, or Alan Blinder's uh, front page interview in the Wall Street Journal last year, uh, speculation about how much impact trade and services, whether you call it outsourcing or offshoring or offshore outsourcing, how much impact is that going to have on the U.S. labor market? My fear as I travel around and talk to people about this is that Blinder's story is still kind of what's stuck in people's head. And his story goes roughly something like this. Services have become more tradable. And uh, the service sector is big. Okay, and in fact, there are a lot of uh, occupations, a lot of jobs in the service sector that have very high wages. And there are populous, labor abundant, low wage countries like India where there are highly educated people who are willing to do these service activities for less. So where Blinder kind of connects those dots is to say that we're going to lose a lot of these high-wage service jobs. And in fact, his policy prescription is that the U.S. should encourage uh, students to specialize in non-tradable service activities. Okay, so what I'd like to do is take the next, I guess, hour and talk through kind of my perspective on, uh, on how we should think about trade and services. Um, what makes this very difficult is that the data, the official statistical data infrastructure on the service sector in general doesn't compare very favorably to what we collect, say, for agriculture or manufacturing. But this is, this is particularly acute when we're talking about trade and services. Okay, so if, if you looked at goods trade, uh, there would be something like, depending on whether you're talking about imports or exports, somewhere between 10 and 12,000 product categories where there's very detailed data collected. The Census Bureau publishes very detailed data at that for 10,000 categories for every country that the United States trades with, e either imports or exports. When we look at services trade, we have about 30 categories. Okay, and there's very little geographical detail. So to credibly talk about trade and services, what's happening, what's going to happen, how we should think about it, is very difficult. So we're left with, you know, kind of researchers being creative. And what I'm going to talk about is, is my attempt at uh, a methodology to identify what within the service sector is tradable. Okay, so, you know, it's, it's a methodology. I'll try to persuade you that uh, it's a reasonable way to think about this and a reasonable way to carve up the service sector. But truth is, we don't have very good data on trade and services. So that any attempt to do this is going to be potentially flawed. Okay, once I try to convince you of uh, how I divvy up the service sector into tradable and non-tradable activities, then try to look, kind of work through what are the risks from imports of services? What are the risks to U.S. jobs? How should we think about that? What's often lacking in this conversation is what are the opportunities? Is there potential for exports of services? And I'll try to provide some evidence on why I think that there is potential for the U.S. to export services. And so that often the, the public dialogue on this is, we're just going to lose jobs. There's no talk about the jobs that we'll gain. So I'll try to highlight that. I'll present a few facts on uh, what the potential labor market impact might be, informed by kind of the, the preceding part, and then also provide some facts on as best as I can tell what the labor market impact to date has been. Wrap up with what I think some of the implications of the analysis are. And then we'll have Q&A. Um, however, if, uh, 
if there's something that I say isn't clear um, or you want to uh, you know, chime in, please feel free. I think this is a small enough group where we can uh, have this be a little interactive. Okay, so just uh, to kind of preview where I'm going to end up, um, I'm going to say I'll agree with Blinder. Many service activities are tradable, or at least the way I look at it is many service activities are traded within the United States and thus at least potentially tradable internationally. Okay, in fact, by my reckoning, there are more jobs in tradable professional services than there are in manufacturing. Okay, so this is a real thing. This is a real deal. This is an important topic. Okay? But just because there's a lot of them, it doesn't mean we're going to lose all of these jobs. Okay? These tradable service activities are consistent with U.S. comparative advantage. And I'll elaborate on this more. So I think that we stand to gain jobs as well as lose them. Okay? I think there's... Uh, Potential for U.S. to expand service exports, okay? So the U.S. could gain jobs there. And trade and services, I don't think, has had a measurable impact on labor market outcomes in the United States to date, okay? When it does, I think it'll be low-wage workers who are most affected. Okay, so is the service sector important? And... What you realize as soon as you try to talk to people about services is that everyone has their own concept of what services are. It's a big kind of grab, bag, grab all category uh, that is very diverse, very large. So I'm going to restrict myself. When I talk about services, it's mostly going to be professional services. Okay? Um, and you say, well, Brad, that's, you know, that's a pretty small chunk. Of services, and if you if you are accustomed to thinking of services as retail and wholesale, finance, transportation, construction, all those things, you're right. It's a small chunk of the service sector. However, even the the professional services that I'm going to focus on, which are information, professional, scientific, and technical, and uh, administrative support. Not, not a broad swath of the economy, but those three sectors are bigger than the manufacturing sector, which is when people talk about trade, that's what we, that's what we have been preoccupied with, is talking about the manufacturing sector. So this little business service sector that I'm going to focus on is already considerably larger than the manufacturing sector in 2006, and it's growing more rapidly. Okay, the manufacturing sector is shrinking. This sector is growing. Okay, so I think it's worth talking about it. And by narrowing it down, it's going to help us think through the, some of the issues presented by this issue. Okay? So now I want to walk you through my idea for how we can classify all this service activity is tradable or non-tradable. And it's going to rely on what I think is fairly simple intuition. Okay? It's that we're accustomed to thinking of things as, for a long time, economists thought of services as non-tradable. Right? If you needed to get your hair cut, you needed to be in the same room with your barber or your hairdresser. Right? Or if you needed to buy groceries or you needed to talk to your divorce attorney, you needed to have face-to-face -face interaction. Okay? But now there are a number of service activities where you don't seem to need face-to-face -face interaction. For the kinds of things that require face-to-face -face interaction, we would imagine that those are pretty ubiquitously distributed with population. So where there are lots of people, there will be lots of barbers, there will be lots of divorce lawyers, okay? Because you need face-to-face -face interaction. But what we want to look for is industries that are concentrated beyond population, okay? In, in the uh, economic geography literature, there's, there's a long history of thinking about um, 
geographic concentration, uh, location quotients, where you look at the share of a sector's, a region's share of a sector's employment compared to that region's share of total employment. And so what I've shown here is industry, industrial classification for Seattle, okay, Boeing, right? And what you see is Seattle has a lot more aircraft and parts manufacturing employees than it has population. So aircraft production is concentrated in Seattle. It's not because people in Seattle like to consume more airplanes than other parts of the country. It's that Seattle produces airplanes and exports them. I think people are very comfortable with that, thinking of that in that way. Okay? If we add services, what we see is that Seattle indeed has a large concentration of employment and software publishing. This is Microsoft. Okay? And again, it's... The same reasoning applies. It's not that Seattle, people in Seattle consume a lot more Vista. It's that Microsoft produces it and ships it all over the world. Okay, so we get a geographic concentration of production of a service that's tradable. Okay, barbers, we don't see this concentration because you need to be face-to-face -face with your barber to have a haircut. But these tradable activities we'll see concentrations of production. Okay, so we're going to use this insight to develop, uh, to classify industries into tradable and non-tradable activities. Okay, so what I'll do is just construct a genie measure of how concentrated employment is in an industry. And then what I've done here is just plotted, so here's for the manufacturing sector, plotted the geographic concentration of production in the manufacturing sector. We're accustomed to thinking of manufacturing as pretty tradable. Okay, what we see is that, indeed, most of manufacturing, most manufacturing industries are above the line of uh, kind of evenly distributed, which is this uh, green line at, at point one. Okay, the... The manufacturing industries that are considered non-tradable, I think there's five of them right here, okay? Cement, concrete, gypsum, and lime production, structural metal fabrication, machine shops, and printing shops. So all either a very high weight to value ratio, so you don't trade them very far. So this kind of confirms that this notion of geographic concentration is going to help us get at tradability. If we look at services, again, what falls out of this is pretty intuitively appealing. Okay, we have service activities, many of which appear tradable. Our, the, the geographic concentration of production is concentrated enough to appear tradable, and a, and a bunch that aren't. And the kinds of things that are geographically concentrated make sense. Software, uh, movies, uh, music recording, securities, commodities trading, things like that. Okay, those are the types of service activities that are geographically concentrated. And we're pretty comfortable thinking about those as tradable. The kinds of things that are, aren't think retail banking. Okay, you, you, there's still a need for uh, geographic presence for retail banking. So those are the kinds of service activities that aren't. So what falls out of this is, I think, very maybe I'm biased, but it seems very intuitively appealing. When we look in the manufacturing sector, uh, we see that this tradability index is positively correlated with international trade. It's positively correlated with the number of exporters, the share of exporters, exports to shipment ratios, imports, and import penetration. So it, it seems to be capturing the essence. Okay? So what this then allows us to do is go and look at the characteristics of the industries that are tradable and non-tradable and count up how many jobs are in tradable service activities. Okay? And what we see is that there's a big chunk of jobs in professional services that we classify as tradable. In fact, of its share of total employment, more in that than in manufacturing. 
So again, as I said at the outset, this suggests that, indeed, trade and services could be a big deal. Okay? A lot of activity, a lot of economic activity, a lot of jobs are in sectors that, that appear traded within the United States and thus, and thus, at least potentially, could be traded internationally. And we can also go and look at the workers' characteristics in these tradable activities. And when I started this, I didn't expect to find this, but it was um, striking to me how different they look. Workers in tradable service activities look very different. They are highly educated. So if you look at the share of workers in tradable services compared to manufacturing with a college degree, it's more than double. If you look at advanced degrees, again, it's more than double. Okay, so highly educated. And these workers are also highly cons uh, c compensated. They have high earnings. Okay, part of that is due to higher education. But if we take that out, if we control for um, workers' characteristics like education, age, gender, those types of things, we see that workers that are in tradable industries and tradable occupations, so I, I didn't talk about the occupation stuff, but I can do that same exercise for occupations, and we did that. And we can classify workers, are you in a tradable industry or a tradable occupation or both? What we see is that workers in tradable industries and tradable occupations earn significantly higher, have significantly higher earnings than similar workers in the same sector, almost 20% higher. Okay, and that's, again, that's uh, washing out the education effects. You see, these are highly skilled people. Okay? Here, if you're in a tradable industry but not a tradable occupation, you still have a pretty big earnings boost. And then non-tradable industry but tradable occupation, again, you still earn more than 10% more than some workers who are observationally similar to you. Okay, so high skill, highly educated workforce within the tradable services sector. So some say, well, and this is Blinder's story. Well, geez, you know, we got these high wage jobs and they can be done anywhere. So we're going to lose all these jobs, right? There are people in India who can work cheaper than this. These are really high wage jobs. So we're going to lose all these jobs. Right? We're not, we're not to the audience participation <laughs> part of the uh, program yet, I guess. We'll work to warm you up. So that, that's what some people think. I mean, I'm struck. I talk to even economists who will kind of say the same thing. Right? Oh, well, these high wage jobs, India's you know, got all these highly educated people. They're willing to work for less. We're going to lose all these jobs. I, I think that that ignores. I don't know, a century or so of trade theory. I'll talk about that in a second. But more importantly, it ignores the facts. Okay, so first, let's talk about trade theory. Right, so this is the notion of comparative advantage. And I don't know how long it's been since anybody sat in a trade class. A um, couple years, maybe a couple decades. Um, so just a little reminder. So, so one thing is absolute advantage and then comparative advantage. And it's comparative advantage that's important. Okay, so absolute advantage is I'm better at you than everything. Okay? I'm just I'm better than you at everything, and that's just how it is. I have absolute advantage in all activities. So for countries, maybe it's that, you know, I, I don't think this is true, but let's just for a second assume that India could do everything more efficiently than the United States. Or for lower cost. They have absolute advantage. Okay? So maybe they'll do everything. Does that make sense? They can do it cheaper. They can do everything cheaper than we can. Uh, again, I don't think that's true, but let's just for a second pretend it was. Does that mean they're going to do everything? 
a certain point in the run of people. And so what are, what are they going to do? They're going to specialize in what they do best. Even though they're better at maybe at everything, they're going to specialize in what they do best. And this is the notion of comparative advantage, right? Even though I'm better than you at everything, you will be relatively better than me at something. Okay, so, so think about this. So let, let's say you've got a high-priced attorney who's a really good typist. Should she type her own briefs? No. Even if she can type faster than her secretary, it makes sense to have the attorney do attorney work and the typist, the, the secretary, do the typing. Right? Because it's the, the attorney can go do more productive stuff even though she's a faster typer. This is the notion of comparative advantage. Okay, so even if India were, were better than us at, every, than at everything, there are still some things that we would do relatively better than them. Okay, and so it's how to think about comparative advantage. So countries specialize in where they have comparative advantage. Even if they don't have absolute advantage in anything, they'll specialize in where they have Comparative advantage. Is everybody with me so far? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. So how should we think about then the risks from import competition? Well, I, we know quite a bit about import competition in the manufacturing sector. As I, as I kind of opened up with, the data in the manufacturing sector is pretty good. Pretty good. We have pretty good, pretty detailed information on what's traded between countries, what goods are traded between countries, and we have pretty good information on what's happening in the manufacturing sector in the United States. Researchers can access very detailed uh, trade information and also very detailed information on individual manufacturing plant performance. Link those up and see what's happened when there are big increases in imports in the United States. Okay, and, to, and to just kind of, in a picture, try to show a summary of all that analysis. Here, what I want to do is just show, so this is for the manufacturing sector. And what, what we've graphed along here is this, the, um, the horizontal axis is just the industry average annual wage. So... Low-wage manufacturing industries on this end, relatively high-wage manufacturing industries on this end. Okay, so you've got apparel and textile products, leather products at this end, chemicals, petroleum, that kind of stuff at this end. And then the vertical axis is just the share of imports that come from really low-wage countries. So think China. And what's striking about this is that maybe, maybe China could, could do everything. You know, their workers in chemicals and their workers in petroleum and their workers in cars are cheaper. They're all cheaper than U.S. workers. What you see is that imports from low-wage countries are concentrated in low-wage labor-intensive industries. Okay, it's comparative advantage. Low-wage, labor-intensive countries produce and export low-wage, labor-intensive stuff. Countries like the United States import low-wage, labor-intensive products from labor-abundant, low-wage countries. Okay, you can, in the, in the policy brief that was distributed, we kind of draw this notional just to, to simplify things, this notional threshold that's, say, $40,000 a year. So if you're in, in an industry in manufacturing in the United States where the average wage is below $40,000, life is becoming uncomfortable, right? There is growing, there is high levels and growing levels of imports from very low-wage countries. And this has kind of a predictable impact. Manufacturing plants in those industries that face high levels of imports from low-wage countries are more likely to shut down 
and have lower employment growth. Okay, but what you see here is that these high wage industries, there, there isn't that pressure. Okay, there's not that pressure. So those, those industries face very low levels of low wage import competition. Again, it's comparative advantage. Low wage labor abundant countries do low wage stuff, labor abundant, labor intensive stuff. Everybody still with me? Yeah. 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 Sure. Sure. Yeah. These were. I think these are 2006 numbers. Um, so yeah. So my sense of what that would do is start to move this notional threshold down, and you'd see, you know, kind of the marginal industry. Uh, you would see less competition from low wage countries. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, maybe a more sophisticated way to think about it is not this threshold, but you know you're a lot in a lot deeper trouble at this low end, and it kind of the probability of bad things happening diminishes as wages go up. Okay. But now let's. To, to continue with the comparative advantage thing, now let's look at exports. What is the U.S. export? Okay, again, if our workers, if, if we can't, you know, we're high wage and everything, we can't export anything if you go with absolute advantage. But when you think about comparative advantage, so this is exports per worker, you see that it's at the high end where there's export intensive production. Okay, we import, remember the, the curve was the opposite. We import a lot of low-wage stuff. We export a lot of high-wage stuff. Again, that 40,000 threshold seems to be kind of where the U.S. has comparative advantage. Above $40,000 in average wages, quite a bit of export intensity. Seems to suggest the U.S. has comparative advantage in those activities. Okay, we don't export much per worker in these, you know, low wage labor intensive activities. And then on services we have a we do have a little bit of data. So here I'll start to stake the services sector back in. Okay, here if we looked at this is basically the same picture I just showed you, but for the service sector, for professional services. And what you see is, again, it's the high-wage stuff that the U.S. tends to export in terms of services. We don't have very good import numbers for services, but on the export side, we have a little bit better data. So, again, this suggests that this notion of comparative advantage and this threshold that's somewhere, you know, notionally around $40,000 above that, the U.S. has comparative advantage. That's the stuff we're going to do. We're going to do it. We're going to export it. It's this lower end stuff that we're going to tend to import. Okay, this is key to understanding how this is going to play out in the labor market. This notion of comparative advantage. Um, so, so I think it, it, it depends on exactly what's happening. If, if it's just a large number of people that are trained as 
doctors and attorneys in these countries, but it's still low relative to the share of highly trained people in the United States, I would expect this to still hold. Okay, but if, if the share of people in India who are highly trained approaches or exceeds that from the, in the United States, then, yes, I would expect this to change. Then the U.S. would no longer be a relatively skill-abundant country. Okay? So it's, that's, what's, that's what's driving this comparative advantage is that the U.S. is a, is a relatively skill-abundant country. So a bigger share of the population here is highly educated. And it depends on the share of the population here. And there. Okay, so it's kind of it's that the relative comparison of those two shares. Okay, so that's across industries. There we've been talking about industries with different characteristics. High wage, high skill, intensive industries, the U.S., because it's skill abundant, has comparative advantage in across industries. It's low wage, labor intensive industries that we don't have comparative advantage in. What I want to do is just briefly talk about comparative advantage within industries. So, this is again where uh, this very detailed information that we have on the manufacturing sector helps us enrich this picture even a little bit more. Okay, I'll do this fairly quickly. So, we can look at individual firms and individual plants within the manufacturing sector that export. And what we see is that, and I think that these results are, have, have kind of percolated out into the general dialogue, is that exporters are better. Okay, they're bigger, whether in terms of employment or sales. They're more productive, and they pay higher wages. Even if you compare them within the same very detailed industry, Plants that export pay higher wages. They're more productive and they're bigger. They're more capital intensive. They're just better. Okay? Exporters are different. They're rare. In manufacturing, only about 25% of plants export. They're bigger, more capital intensive, more skill intensive. They're more productive, more likely to survive and grow. Okay? For when these results first came out, people were like, whoa, you know, exporting's good. We need to get more firms into exporting because that'll raise their wages goes the other way. Okay, it's only the good guys that can get into the export market. Okay, there are some costs entering the export market, so only the most efficient producers can export. So that helps us think about how trade and falling trade costs, or indeed rising trade costs, will play out within an industry. Okay, so we could imagine and you could line up all the firms or all the plants within an industry, so this is within an industry, there are some that are low productivity and some that are high productivity. Okay, and even domestic competition is going to do what to the low productivity guys? They're going to go out of business, right? They'll be competed out of business. Okay, and so, and if we have some costs to export, to enter in a, a foreign market, Who's going to export? If you have to pay a big price, you know, you have to set up distribution channels, you've got to do a lot of research, maybe you have to modify your product so it fits other regulatory structures. So you need to put a lot of money in before you can even start exporting. That's what economists call a sunk cost because once you've made that investment, you can't get it back. So if there are these sunk costs to exporting, who's going to export? I just told you it's going to be the high end. It's only going to be the most productive producers that can export. And so then when we have falling trade costs like we've had over the past couple decades, what happens? Well, the low end, the least productive firms face more import competition and are more likely to fail. Okay, but is there a plus side to this? Yeah, well as export costs fall, then the most productive firms that we're not exporting can start to export. Okay, and this is the and this is the beauty of trade, right? Is without any change at any of these plants, there's been no technological change, but measured at an aggregate level, because we've gotten rid of economic activity at the low productivity end, 
and we've increased economic activity at the high productivity end, this is productivity growth. This is increases in standards of living. Okay, this is, these are the gains to trade. Okay, it's, it's this, it's by specializing in what we do well across industries and even within industries that we get productivity gains from trade. And then we do have some data on service producers who export, and we see that the picture is much the same. Okay, they're rare. They're even more rare than goods producers who export. But they're bigger. They have higher labor productivity, and they pay higher wages. So there seems to be a big opportunity if trade costs and services are truly falling, uh, an opportunity to get the same kind of reallocation away from low productivity to higher productivity within the services sector. All right, so now uh, shift to talking about labor market impact. Okay, so this is where that notion of comparative advantage uh, is, is key to how I'm thinking about it. So what I've done here is just graphed the um, cumulative distribution of employment in the manufacturing sector and tradable services. Okay, the blue line is the manufacturing sector. The purple line is services, tradable services. Okay, and so what you can tell is along this axis again is the average wage in the industry. And then this shows how much of the employment in that sector is in industries that pay, pay, pay less than this amount. Okay? So at our, our notional $40,000 threshold, what we see is that about 60% of employment in the manufacturing sector is in industries that pay $40,000 a year or less. That's, that's what this is showing us. It shows us how much employment in the manufacturing sector is in these average wage industries. And what we see in services is that the share of employment in the tradable services sector that's in industries below $40,000 is about half, it's about 33%. Okay, so if you're thinking about who's vulnerable to trade, you know, Blinder says, oh, it's all services. You know, we have these high wage service jobs, they're all gonna disappear. Okay, what I hope I've convinced you is that, no, that's not really the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is this notion of comparative advantage. The US is relatively skill abundant, so we have comparative advantage in high-skill activities. So that suggests that most of the jobs in this tradable services sector are consistent with U.S. comparative advantage. We're not going to lose these jobs. Okay? If, we, if, if trade and services grows, we're likely to pick up jobs at that end as exporters. Okay? What, where there's going to be Issues is still in the manufacturing sector. Okay, long recognized that the U.S. just really doesn't have comparative advantage in a lot of goods production. Okay, so only about a third of those uh, tradable service activities are in industries that seem vulnerable to low-wage offshoring. India, think of it as India. Okay, whereas... You know, 60% of jobs in the manufacturing sector are in industries that are probably vulnerable to low-wage import competition. Think China. Okay, if we look at kind of net employment outcomes, um, these are in the, in the handout. Uh, you can see them a little bit better, but what you hear, have here is 
non-tradable services and tradable services. And what you see is that net employment growth in tradable service industries is about the same as non-tradable. You see manufacturing is getting kind of hammered. Okay, if we look at occupations, it's the same story. Tradable service occupations and non-tradable service occupations have roughly the same net employment growth. And if we looked at wages, median wages, as an indicator of labor market outcomes, again, we would see that tradable service activities have roughly the same median wage changes as non-tradable, suggesting there hasn't been an enormous impact in the labor market yet from trade and services. Okay, so analytical conclusions. I'm convinced that many service activities are tradable. Okay, however, I don't expect that a large share of these tradable ex service activities will move offshore. These tradable services are high skill, high wage, and therefore consistent with U.S. comparative advantage. Okay, I expect the U.S. will gain jobs in high skill, high wage services through exporting. Yeah, this is dangerous here, policy implications, but we'll, we'll be a little provocative. Um, so I guess the first one that's unsaid on here, but I guess you are the people to make the pitch to, we need better services data. To, to do this exercise, you're relying on my creativity or somebody else's. I think mine's the best, but... Um, but because we don't have real hard numbers, we're going to be left with somebody's creativity. And that's not very good. Because services are a big part of the economy. Big and growing. And trade and services is going to be with us for a while. And the fact that you know, we don't have numbers means we're flying blind in a, in a policy way. And that, to me, doesn't feel very good. So I guess policy takeaway number one, remember this at appropriations time. Help your statistical agencies. Um, so more substantive policy implications. The U.S. seems well positioned to export services. And thus, it would seem that we should be pushing for services liberalization. Not fearing it, not, not a protectionist impulse like Blinder seems to engender, but no, this is where we have comparative advantage. We should be pushing for services liberalization. Second is that low-skill, low-wage workers will face continued competitive pressure. Okay, most of this is going to be in manufacturing. Okay, but there are low-wage, labor-intensive service activities that are likely to face import competition or offshoring pressure, whatever you want to call it, from low-wage, labor-abundant countries. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. Okay? To, to my way of seeing it, there's no economic reason to exclude service workers from programs like TAA. Okay? Trade adjustment assistance right now, statutorily defined, it's just for people who produce goods. That, I don't see an economic reason for that. When you, when you talk to people, they say, well, oh, services is too big, too big to expand TAA to. I would say that our estimates suggest that expansion of TAA won't break the bank. Okay? And then I think there is. People have seemed to have, you know, uh, the whole blinder thing said, well, education is not the solution. I would argue that I think it, there is a continuing role for education and training. If we're relatively high skill, if we are a high skill, abundant country, we will continue to have comparative advantage in these high wage activities. If we're not, we won't. And we'll specialize in manufacturing. Okay, and so then, then just uh, the last kind of food for thought, two pictures. Um, so this is, uh, speaking of skills and relative skills, this is the share of a country's population that's basically college educated. Okay, the, the data are not always comparable, but think of it roughly that way. And what you see here is that this is the U.S. 
and this is Canada. And this is for workers 55, aged 55 to 64. So if you look at kind of our peak human capital cohort, 55 to 64, you see that the U.S. and Canada stand alone in terms of the share of the population that's college educated. This is why I say we're a skill abundant country. If you look at India, you know, it's pretty low. But there are numbers. There are numbers. They are. You're right. The, the numbers may be, the, the gross numbers may be bigger. Um, I, you know, pe people. You know, I don't know. I, 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 um, I don't travel a ton, but when I visit places like Luxembourg and the Netherlands, life looks pretty good. You know, they have high skill, high wage, highly educated workforces, and they seem to be doing just fine. Even though they're small, they they find their niche. I mean, I think, I think you know, when we talk about India, the problem with India is that I think that the rest of their economy, they shouldn't specialize in, in trading service activities. They are a labor-abundant, relatively low-skill labor-abundant country. They should be specializing in the same kinds of things that China does, but they don't. And I think the reason is, is that their manufacturing sector is regulation-bound, domestic regulation in India is really distorting what happens in India. And that's why there's this class of highly educated people who aren't otherwise occupied in industry doing what their country has comparative advantage in doing. I don't expect that that will persist. I think that as they grow, they're, you know, those talented people who couldn't find jobs in other sectors will, will find them and their wages will rise and they won't be as export competitive. Okay? But this is for workers 55 to 64. Again, kind of peak earnings. If I do it for 25 to 34, picture looks a, kind of different. Okay? So here's the U.S. There's Canada again. So then, it, you know, I mean, these countries aren't huge. You know, but you add them all up, and all of a sudden where the U.S. used to kind of stand alone in the world in terms of skill, it's not as true anymore. And I guess if I were to say that, you know, there's a, is there a risk to this? It's not a risk from trade. It's a risk from us not being skilled. If we're not skilled, we'll... You know, if we're not relatively skill abundant, we'll concentrate in activities that are middle of the road. Thank you. All right, we will now have time for uh, a question and answer session. So please just raise your hand and we'll bring over the mic to, so you can ask your question so everyone can hear. But please, just a reminder again, please fill out the yellow survey <coughs> as they help us evaluate our programs. I wasn't provocative enough. <laughs> I've, I've been thinking about um, the problems with um, poor data on services trade for a long time and um, I've been thinking that one of the problems is that so much of the information is proprietary that that I think services trade is far larger than we can ever imagine that that legal firms don't want to say oh my we really made a killing on on our activities in Dubai and consulting firms you can be big or you can be small and you can <coughs> do well in business all over the world and that <coughs> if they give if they provide too much of that or brag too much about it it gives too much um, competitive intelligence about what they're doing <coughs> my question is how could the statistics be improved um, what could the Department of Commerce do to get a better grasp uh, on it and then I also had another question. 
Um, you didn't mention the situation of small businesses, and Department of Commerce has worked a lot on encouraging small businesses to get involved in trade and providing export assistance, and that is one way for them to grow their, yeah. their business. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so let me, uh, the first on the data. So, um, so in this country we have a means to collect data without fear of proprietary competitive, bad competitive impact. And, and that's the statistical agencies promise confidentiality when they collect the data. And, and I think that businesses, while they view the, the surveys as a nuisance, um, I think they believe that the confidentiality is protected. Um, what I th so that I don't think is the issue. The issue is, are we devoting enough resources to be comprehensive enough in the service sector? So in the goods sector, just by coincidence, we tax, right? We, we levy taxes on imports. So every good has to pass through a port, either an airport or a seaport. And the customs folks are pretty diligent about making sure that they get their, their due. So somebody has to fill out a form every time a good passes through a port. Uh, with services, there, there, aren't, there aren't the ports, right? The, the legal services briefs with the, you know, it's just really hard to track. So what the BEA does is does surveys of firms to ask them how much they export and how much they import. And I think that the sample sizes that they survey are woefully too small. Uh, there's not enough breadth. There's not enough depth. There aren't enough numbers. I don't think they have the resources they need to do this properly. Um, it's harder than goods because you're relying on surveys. There's not an administrative component. But, you know, on the export side, the Census Bureau with the uh, Shippers Export Declarations has, has done a lot. You know, the export data is pretty good. Um, and, again, that's not survey that it, it looks and feels like an administrative program even though it's not uh, on the BEA side that the job is the, the job is harder for sure but my guess is you know the, the amount of money that's spent on that program is tiny uh, and, the, and, the, and the and the number of survey forms that they mail out and get back is is way too small way too small okay uh, it's not I, I think it's they don't want to be bothered. No, they're not ever named or anything. They can be identified. I think that, not, not in the data. You know, by what they do, you know, if they have. Uh, the statistical agencies are very careful about now producing statistics where you could re-identify somebody. I, I, I don't think that that's the, the, they don't want to take the time to fill out the forms. That's a problem. But neither do the manufacturers, but. The statistical, statistical agencies have just ground them down and, you know, beat on them for decades to get them to fill out the forms. So on the, on, the, on the small business stuff, I mean, what our research suggests is that it's the people who are the most productive uh, that are best suited to export, and that tends to be the big, big guys. Um, sure, there can be small niche firms that are productive and competitive, on uh, on a global scale, but um, I would I wouldn't put resources in trying to convince people to export. I'll, you know, making it easier to do it, that's fine. Um, you seem somewhat sanguine, I might say about the idea of our losing share in the low skilled jobs and and the the um, you know apparel sector and things like that um, but there are some policymakers who say no we can't lose that kind of work in this country not just for employment reasons but some would even say national security reasons that you know 
what if we get into a big war or something and, you know, we don't have those sectors in this country anymore and that kind of thing. Um, can, can you speak to that sort of argument at all? Not necessarily just on the national security or the employment side, but just generally the idea that it's good for our country. The, the, the argument, can you respond to the argument that it is good for a country to have all the different sectors available in case for whatever reason? It, it, it's less economically efficient for us to do everything. You know, I don't, I don't raise my own food. I don't, uh, you know, I don't have cows. I don't milk my cows. I don't grow my own food. I don't sew my own clothes because it's more efficient for me to go out and earn money as a professor and buy a lot of that stuff. I'd starve to death. Um, I, I don't think it's too big a reach to say that c countries should specialize in what they're good at. Um, you know, there may be uh, counterweight arguments on the national security side um, that you think we need to have certain activities domestic, um, and, and, and I'm probably not um, the best person to weigh the merits of those national security arguments. What I would point out is that you're paying a price, right? It's less efficient. It's less efficient. That doesn't mean that efficiency is the overarching um, criteria, um, but by maintaining economic activity in areas where we do not have comparative advantage, we're paying more for it. Okay, and, and, and maybe there are good reasons to do that, but we should acknowledge that we are paying more for it, and there should be strong arguments about why we're doing that. And, and apparel I don't find very compelling. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think, you know, well, what about the workers? And I, and I think that this is where, you know, this kind of trade policy can have long-running deleterious effects. You know, the MFA was negotiated in, I guess, the Kennedy administration. So we've had 40 years of apparel protection. And it, it seems like it came as a surprise in 2005 when that stuff was taken off. And, and it's like how many workers, how many young workers were, you know, given the wrong economic incentives to leave high school and, and go work in the mill when that was going to, you know, that was an art, artificial um, artifact of the, of the policy space. So I, I think you need strong reasons why you would want to do that. Not that there may, there may be. Um, I guess my question was about a comparative advantage, and I know you say you specialize in what you're doing, but it seems like a lot of countries, especially in Asia, like Korea and Japan, some of these tigers are basically, you know, they'd be still growing rice if that's what they did in the 50s, or the 40s and 50s, but they've basically used a lot of a combination of mercantilist policies, you know, subsidies, loans, monopolies, subsidies, whatever, um, to kind of create, you know, electronics industries, semiconductors, things like that. And it seems like China's also been doing, you know, mercantilist policies kind of build up their industries. And I guess my question is, on our side, um, and not, maybe not so much the low end, but, I mean, do you think there is a point where the U.S. needs to keep a certain base of industry? Because that still is where, a lot, of, as you pointed out, some of the high-paying high jobs are. And what kind of policies do you think are best? And I guess, do you think the U.S. has a role in um, mercantilist policies, like trying to promote industry? Do you think they can just, at what level can they say we can just lose it all and specialize in whatever we specialize in, and is the WTO the best way to go about that and say free trade? Or I guess how, how should the U.S. respond to mercantilist policies from other nations is kind of where I'm going with that. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I think that, you know, while, while we're in the midst of the hangover from the mercantilist policies of, of East Asia, uh, it sure was fun. <laughs> I mean, they gave us a lot of stuff on the cheap through their mercantilist policies. And, uh, and, w and I think that we mismanaged that gift. Um, but I don't know that it was bad to take it. Right. I guess, but um, so you're not concerned about industry? Like, the, like if we lost a lot of our industry, that's good. as long as we're removing that thing, you have the concern? Or do you think that yeah, I, level I, I, who, who would pick? You know, who would pick which industry should we keep? Um, I, I guess the other thing, and I don't have a picture for it, but if you look at global manufacturing output, 
I think the U.S. is still number one. So, down the road, you know, I mean, so we're, you know, I mean, China's a, what, a fifth of global population? So you would expect them to be, you know, big uh, in terms of production of all sorts of stuff. And I, I don't, I don't think that it should be a policy to, to say we need to keep an industry just because we need to keep it. If there's a national security argument, that's something different. But uh, I don't see, I mean, to keep apparel jobs, that seems like a mistake. This is a really formal yeah. setting for, I think I might just, uh, we, we uh, can sit around a table, I think. Yeah. Uh, Evan Alexander from the Ways and Means Minority Staff. Uh, what is, or what does an export of software publishing look like? What is the trade there? What what is uh, uh, it's Vista. So is somebody in J uh, Japan opening up uh, or somebody yeah. buying a PC that that has Vista loaded on it? Loaded onto it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I mean, it, you know, in in the national in, in the export numbers that I showed you were from Census. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the, the definitions, you know, when we get into, our, our, is your concern about royalties versus licensing, uh, that kind of thing? It, it's more of a, um, it, and I don't know if it's a concern, it's me trying to wrap my head around what a services export looks like and whether or not analogizing to goods trade can hold, because in your example of software publishing, there's an export of the, Potentially an export of the uh, machine that the software is loaded onto. So is, uh -huh. it, fair, is it fair to look at that? Well, okay. I mean, I mean, imagine that a that a consumer in Japan downloaded Vista. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's that's an export. That's a services export. Um, or they downloaded uh, something from iTunes mm -hmm. that you know an American artist had produced. That would be a services export also. And if, if uh, a, a bank. Uh, opened up a bricks and mortar bank in China. A U.S. bank opened up a, a retail bank in, in China. That is not a services export. That's commercial a commercial presence situation that we're not talking about as part of your correct. Okay. Yeah, I didn't focus much on finance and insurance for exactly those reasons. That it, how you think about what's being traded you know, risk and things like that, I had a hard time with. I, I think it's important, um, but I wasn't ready to go there yet. I appreciate the analysis very much. Um, do you, are you aware of other studies out there that will link up the effect of an export on U.S. employment sort of more directly? Or um, I think your analysis is more sort of theoretical. Uh -huh. Do you know anything more empirical that shows relationships to U.S. employment and export data, either in goods or services? Um, I, I'm sure there's stuff out there, um, but it's it's hard to do well. Um, hard hard to, to make that link yeah. between exports and employment. And, it, and if you're thinking about it kind of as a, at the aggregate level, we don't think that that exports create jobs or imports destroy jobs in the aggregate. I mean, the number of people that employed is what drives that is the number of people who want to work. Um, w what trade can do is affect what sectors those people work in. Um, so, uh, you know, some people will say, well, the changes in the in the dollar or changes in the trade deficit will translate into so many manufacturing jobs. Mm, yeah, the manufacturing sector will grow on the margin, but the number of people employed in the United States won't change. Is that? Yeah, yeah, no, that, thanks very much. Shortly after what you, what you put up there, though, to me, if somebody points to somebody who lost a service job in the United States because a service job was created in another country, the, the logical response is, yeah, there are two more 
service jobs in the United States for each one that was open somewhere else as a result of trade and services. Is that sort of a, is that like? I, 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 I would be reluctant to say two, two to one. I would just say that, you know, service jobs are being created in this country from service exports. Undoubtedly, service jobs are being destroyed because of service imports. The, the, the relative number, that's a harder question. So what's, what's the point at which the, the, um, the, the, on your graph, it crosses the line of equilibrium? I thought that was like 30 percent of yeah. jobs were subject to being lost to well, well, competition. Would, would, face, would face pressure okay. from, from imports. And, and the other 60, there would be more opportunities to export there. Um, to, you know, the economy to take advantage of that comparative exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And again, if there aren't workers, we're not going to create more jobs than there are workers. Right? So it's, it, if we were creating jobs at the high end, we need workers to staff them. Otherwise, the job won't be created. 